uh, the Old World Church and historic site. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you for coming out to learn about the fascinating archaeology that we have been doing on site for the last couple of years. Let me give a, a little bit of context to uh, the archaeology. Normally you just don't uh, tell us, say, yeah, come on in and dig up all our property. We're actually getting ready uh, in the next few years to remodel that garden. We want to uh, convert it more into it, uh, to keep it as a garden, or move the plant material around, uh, but also make it uh, into what can function as an outdoor classroom space. And we intend uh, to uh, put the poem called the Ride there, which is a large poem, so that will be a large feature. Uh, we uh, thank the city of Boston and the uh, Brown Fund who has given us a grant to do the design work on that, um, as well as the Deacon Hill Garden Club who have given us a grant uh, to do the landscaping design there. So we're in the process of doing that design work. Uh, and if you're interested, you can come back next Thursday night and we are having a public meeting um, to talk about what we're thinking about in there and solicit your ideas. So please come. Uh, and join us for that as part of the design process. We hope to actually go under construction in about 2019. Uh, we made some good progress uh, on our fundraising, but of course you can't build anything until you know how to pay for it. Uh, I am going to point out tonight that we have uh, very recently received a uh, quarter of a million dollar challenge grant uh, from uh, one of our local foundations. They prefer to remain anonymous. Uh, but if you would like to support this overall project, we do have uh, information and envelopes in the back about the, the project called Old North 300, getting ready for our 300th birthday, uh, and any donations you make at this point uh, for the garden part of that project will be matched dollar for dollar by this uh, quarter of a million dollar challenge grant. So um, please uh, continue to watch what we're doing here, come back next week, and uh, uh, give us your ideas about um, how we can be remodeling that garden. I also want to let you know that uh, we have a, a summer series of, of speakers, and our next uh, speaker will be uh, uh, John Stauffer, who will be talking about Charles Sumner and Boston's revolutionary tradition. Um, Sumner, of course, is more Civil War era than uh, uh, Revolutionary War era, but was a prominent sen uh, senator uh, during the uh, lead up to the Civil War and during the Civil War. That promises to be an interesting talk. That is on June 7th at 6.30. And if you don't get our newsletter, please sign up for it. We have an e-newsletter that uh, um, will keep you abreast of all the upcoming events uh, that we have here over the course of the year. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, members of the North End Historical Society who are here tonight, who are uh, co-sponsoring uh, this event, uh, and uh, we're delighted that uh, this event, we're mostly known for our Revolutionary War uh, history, um, but tonight we're really talking about 19th century immigration history, so it's great to um, partner with the North End Historical Society that has that history and more as their focus. I am delighted to uh, introduce uh, one of the real gems uh, in the entire city of Boston, and that's uh, Joe Bagley, uh, who joined the city archaeology program uh, uh, six years ago, for city archaeologist, uh, and he curates a growing repository it's, it's probably in the hundreds of thousands of artifacts now, um, that's currently housed out in West Roxbury. And uh, he is the go-to guy if uh, you're doing any building uh, in uh, um, historic areas where there might be interesting information in the ground. Uh, you cannot do construction without uh, getting uh, approval from uh, the uh, Boston Landmark Commission for whom Joe works. And uh, we're delighted that Joe has worked with us on several things here over the course of the last few years. Uh, and he's been very instrumental the last two years and helping explore the history of the garden next door. Joe received his uh, bachelor's in archaeology from Boston University and a master's from, uh, in archaeology from UMass Boston. He's conducted archaeological surveys um, from Maine to Florida. Um, he specializes in Native American and historical archaeology. Um, he is the author of a book uh, that is for sale in the rear. It's a great book. It's Boston and 50 Artifacts. Uh, and uh, he uses some of the things that he's found on his around Boston um, to uh, help us understand the history of this city. Uh, it's a very popular book. If you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend it. 
recommend it. Um, Joe lives with uh, uh, his wife, uh, Jim, and uh, who's also an archaeologist, and their dog, Jack, is probably an archaeologist, now in the position of the bones, uh, down in the uh, uh, lower levels of the neighborhood of Boston. So I'm delighted uh, to have uh, Joe here, uh, and he's actually been here all day, monkey around, giving his dig, and so you can get up to the minute uh, report uh, on what Joe and on Joe. Talk on the dig where I'm actually still digging. I can't see anything. Um, so, uh, like you said, we've got up to this stuff, and I'll make sure to leave time at the end of the talk to, um, to answer any questions that you might have um, about the dig if I miss any of the data. So, onward. Um, so, just to give you a quick layout of the land, um, if you weren't out in the garden before the beginning of the talk, um, you can see Washington Garden at the very top of the image, relative to Old North, for those of you in the room. It's just outside those windows. Um, and it's essentially a, a fairly small area. It's only about 45 square, uh, feet by 45 feet, um, roughly square in shape. Um, but the reason why we're looking at it is because it was the site of three 19th century buildings. Um, before we mucked around for the past year and a half, this is actually what it used to look like. Um, and you see the, the crab apple tree, um, intact uh, gardens, which are still trying to grow. Um, and in fact, this photo includes the entire project area that we dug. So if you went out there, this is essentially the entire now barren wasteland of archaeological testing um, in, the, in the yard today. So just a little bit of background history on the property itself. This is my favorite map of Boston. It's the 1722 Bonner map. I'm just going to go ahead and see that. Um, and so that red star is actually marking the location of the property itself. Um, you notice the very conspicuously missing building in this map, 1722. This is the year before the church you're all sitting in uh, was built, so it doesn't actually turn up on the map. Um, but before the church came in, there was actually two buildings, um, more or less for 195 and 197 Salem Street are. Uh, which are the church house and the neighboring property. Um, that would have been uh, what was called a brick store. And we're not really sure exactly what that means, except I'm pretty sure it means that it was a store made of brick and not a brick selling store. Um, but that, that's, just, that's been actually a pretty prominent part of the story of this property is that uh, we're finding quite a bit of things in the ground from the 1700s um, and very likely they're related directly to those two buildings that are um, just above the star in this image. Um, we don't have a lot of other details about what the property was used for, um, but given the range of material we're seeing, it's probably a general store that's selling goods to angry people living in the North End. Um, and those goods, if they broke either in transit to the store or just weren't selling very well, seem to have ended up in the backyard of the store, um, in which case that's what we're getting through while we're looking for the 19th century materials. Um, this is another slightly more detailed map that shows uh, the church now being built in 1822. So this is just before the buildings that I'll be mostly discussing today were built. And you can see again, we're in a we're kind of open space just behind a fairly large building. Um, though the property line of the large building ends at the back of the building, but there's still could be trash coming out from that building um, in that time period. So just to kind of set the scene for what's going on in Boston and the North End specifically, um, we have the Revolutionary War occurring, obviously, in the 1770s and very early 80s. Um, and after that, the, the city and the country goes through a period of kind of restarting and rebuilding. Um, and Boston is really kind of just ticking along. And then the War of 1812 comes around, and America's forgotten war. Um, and that really, really devastated Boston. The harbor was essentially shut down once again. Um, and Boston was kind of plunged into a bit of an um, a, a economic downturn. Um, after the War of 1812, things settled down a little bit more again, and that's when we really start seeing this first wave of English immigration after the Revolution of um, relatively um, poor people, not, not drastically poor, but not, not wealthy working class individuals coming over. Many of them were bachelors, um, but some are coming over and starting families or coming with their young families. I'm going to go blind by the end of this talk. <laughs> and, uh, uh, settling in the North End, and they're really representing that first wave of English immigration into the North End. Um, so the topic I'm going to be focusing on today is, is these, these multiple waves of, of people that come into Boston um, and settle into the North End. Uh, today we think of the North End as an Italian neighborhood, or actually more realistically a young urban professional neighborhood, um, which are rapidly replacing the, the Italian families. 
Um, but that, they're just one of the more recent waves of immigrants that have come into the North End. We have it represented on this site, English, Irish, Jewish, and Italian families. Um, sometimes at the same time, we'll go into the more details in a little bit, um, but it really represents this kind of uh, nuanced history. Um, and while we have this opportunity to look at just one, two, and three Unity Court, which is the name of the properties that we're looking at, um, what I want you to remember is that this site is unique today, today because we have the opportunity to dig it. Um, because it's been well preserved by being turned into a garden. Um, it is not an actual unique archaeological site in the sense that this is probably one of hundreds of very similar properties all throughout this neighborhood, many of which are probably gone now because of development. But this is not a unique story to this property. This is really a micro, uh, a, a small look at a much larger story of immigration in the North End. If you have questions, you might have to yell out. I literally can't say anything. Um, so before we do any archaeology, we always have to do a lot of uh, background research. Um, this is going to be really hard to see, but I'll zoom in a little bit. But uh, this is a map that I actually found in the deed records. And anybody that's done deed records, finding maps in the teeth is like hitting the holy grail, finding the holy grail. Um, you, it doesn't happen very frequently, and to find actual property outlines of the actual buildings um, is almost unheard of. So what you're looking at is a map of a development of uh, seven, eight, nine, nine different properties that were all bought essentially from the outside of this church down towards, um, towards to the north, about four or five properties. Um, they were all purchased by uh, John Carter, Car or Thomas Carter, excuse me, Thomas Carter, um, and if anybody thinks that about the name James Bell, he's actually the first bookseller at the Old Corner Bookstore in the 1820s. Um, he wasn't living here, but he was buying property, turning it into new buildings, and then selling it at probably a nice profit. Um, but Carter purchased the property and then went through the process of subdividing that large brick store property in the yard into these nine individual lots um, that he then built buildings on and was sold off to individual families. So the way this was built was almost like a, a, a condo development, essentially, where they're, they're building these very similar looking buildings kind of all in a row. They're building infrastructure underground, like cisterns, which we'll talk a lot about, um, on multiple properties that are being divided amongst multiple properties, and I can go into that a little bit in detail. Um, but we're really going to focus on the bottom left three properties. Um, they're both on this map uh, labeled Timothy Carter, Timothy Carter, and Stephen Lane. None of those individuals actually lived in these properties. These are the people that bought the properties soon after they were built. And, uh, so, uh, a typical lot would have been a little bit bigger than what we're seeing here. Um, but in this case, each of these lots is approximately 45 by 15 feet. Um, so, it's a very, very narrow property. It's essentially two of these pews wide by about two thirds of the length. Um, and you can imagine there's not a lot of room for a lot of rooms. Um, so they're very narrow. Uh, the bottom three properties are each 14 foot wide buildings, uh, 30 feet long, and a 15 foot backyard. So everybody's backyard is roughly 15 by 15 feet. Very, very small area. So yeah, uh, so I already talked about that. The kind of upside down T shape is a passageway that was deliberately constructed to allow access to the rear of the buildings on Unity Court, which is the lower street in the map. Um, that passageway is actually still there. I took some photos of it for you. But that passageway really provides access not just to the rear of the buildings, but to the communal well, which was located dead center in this photo, the pump for the, for the well water, which if you were out on the site, is directly behind the wall, behind the open pit cistern that you see. It's about three feet behind it. Um, and that's where the well would have been in the center of that passage. Um, so this is an amazing piece of history. We actually have the ad for the sale of number one unit of court as it was listed in the newspaper. And so on Thursday in 1831, I shall sell a brick dwelling house situated in Unity Court in the block erected last season and nearest to the church, so that's number one unit of court, with a privilege to a passageway leading from Salem Street, so that's that tunnel, um, built by the faithful workmen, we have no idea who that is, and containing a parlor and a kitchen on the lower floor. So again, 14 feet wide, there's only, there's only enough room for a 14 foot by 14 foot room in the front and a 14 by 14 foot room in the back. So the parlor is facing Unity Court in that direction and the kitchen would have been in the back so you could throw your table straps out the back window. Um, on the lower floor, four chambers, so two on each of the second and third floors, and an attic, which tells us that this, the roof probably wasn't a flat roof, but more of a gable roof. 
similar to the drawing, I think that's a fairly accurate drawing of the building maybe. Um, a good cellar, we haven't dug into that, and an excellent well of water, that's the communal pump. A rainwater cistern, boy how did you know they had a rainwater cistern, there's two huge ones back there. A good yard, <laughs> and other conveniences. Um, if desired by the purchaser, a great portion of the purchase money can remain on mortgage. So that's pretty helpful to archaeologists have this nice little cheat sheet about what the property actually was, seen, uh, was experienced. Um, all right, so back to the lay of the land. So that arrow is marking the tunnel of, um, of that passageway that passed through the building. So if you go out today and take a right out of the church uh, front door, you'll go up about 30 feet up the road, you'll see this tunnel going to the back. If you look down it, there's a tunnel straight through the building. And that tree that you see in the back, in that tiny little spot, is actually the crab apple tree in the back of um, in our in our site. Uh, the well would have been located right at the end of that tunnel. Um, so this is Unity Court. If you went there two days ago, it's a very narrow street, uh, barely wide enough for the Nissan or whatever that is, um, and a huge construction crew. Uh, but that would have been how you access the front doors of these buildings was up Unity Court. This is all of them. This is great. Um, all right, so zooming back into the properties, these are the three properties themselves. You can see we actually have the outline of the three buildings, um, and then it's a little bit hard to see, but there's these thinner rectangles that stick out the back of the buildings. Those are actually wooden additions that come off the back of the buildings. They're one story tall, um, and that's when I saw those, I got really excited because I figured that those have to be where the bathrooms are, where the outhouses are, and it ended up being true. Um, but that's what we were really looking for, was those, out, those L's that come off the back. Um, so what do these buildings actually look like? Um, this is two properties, one street over at this house in the road, um, that I believe were built in the 1830s, 1840s. Um, this is a row house, so this would have been approximately what you would have seen these buildings look like. These are much wider than the buildings that we have here, um, but it gives you a rough idea of how plain, essentially, these buildings would be, not just because of the cost of the buildings, but this is free for vital architecture, so it's gotta be clean and simple, otherwise it doesn't exist. Um, but this would be approximately what we would expect the houses to look like. Um, this is an 1874 map of the building. Again, you can see the main buildings themselves. I'm sorry, this isn't very zoomed in, with the little additions off the back that would contain the outhouses. Um, but you can see that it's a pretty densely built up area, even at that time. Um, and the gap between the church and these buildings would have been the Sexton's house, which isn't existing, but it's just outside that window. Uh, another zoom in, again, you can see the, the pink representing the brick buildings, the three-story brick buildings and the little wooden additions off the back. The red square marks essentially where the, um, the outline of the, uh, the garden wall is-ish. Um, but the three arrows represent the wooden additions off the back that we were hoping would contain the L. This isn't quite accurate as far as where the red square goes, but it gives you an idea approximately. So what I did was I zoomed into that 1830s map and I drew over top of it kind of the main structures that we found over the past year. So um, the thick red line across the bottom, that's the rear foundation of the three properties. Um, we found one cistern on the left. We found an outhouse, a Kirby, that actually straddled both number one unity court, which is the left side, and number two, which is the center. Um, across and underneath the wooden additions off the back, there would have been two side by side, backing up against each other. Then there would have been a pretty wide yard area, which would have been open space, with that cistern that you see out today. And that wall down the middle of the cistern lines up perfectly with the property line between number two and number three in the court. And you can see just behind the, um, the cistern, the rest of it, which is up, um, the word suction pump, which I thought said Indian pump for about a year until somebody corrected me. Um, so that's the pump that they would have got their fresh water from. And then just off the map, or just to the right of that green square, just the, the wall, is where the privy is, just out of our reach, where we can't dig it up. But that would have been the third privy if we were lucky enough to find it. So, um, this is what we actually found when we dug in the backyard. Um, so what you're seeing in this photo on the upper left side is, uh, is the cistern, which you can see on the far left there and then the privy. And see that wall down the middle of the privy? That's actually built down the middle of the property between number one and number two unity court. Um, we'll talk about the contents in a bit, um, or, or right now. Um, so when we did uh, the number one cistern, um, it shaped kind of like a brain skull, or a skull cap, slightly oblong and pinched on one end. Um, when we opened it, we got really excited because we figured, oh, it could be six, eight feet of just solid artifacts all the way down. We weren't that fortunate. Um, we went down almost six feet in nothing but coal ash, which is like this flaky, 
garbage that comes out of your furnace after you burn a coal fire. Um, so essentially, the folks in number one unit in court, we'll talk about them a little bit more in a minute, um, used the cistern once they didn't need it anymore as a place to dump the coal ash and left our archaeologists very few things. Except, oh, this is a nice 3D scan that we got while we were digging that you can see the, how deep the cistern went. Um, kind of that thing that hangs down in the photo there. Um, the very, very bottom of that cistern, we found this thick, 10 centimeter thick, greasy black layer. Um, and that's when the rats started showing up. Um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rats. We have a couple of volunteers that are really into bones, and they really geeked out over that. The rest of us were pretty appalled at just how many rats have fallen into the cistern over about 100 years. Um, that's the tip of the iceberg. There was a lot of rats. Um, we have a couple of bags like this of 19th century rats that we washed. Um, and that's just the pieces that were big enough for us to actually find on our screen. So um, if you want to catch a lot of rats, in an urban environment, I recommend digging a six foot wide hole, <laughs> covering it lightly, and just leave it there for 100 years and you'll catch plenty. Um, so this is the privy itself after we dug it. Um, so on the left side of the photo is number one Unity Court. That's the same family that owned the cistern. On the right side is number two Unity Court. They were very, very kind to us because they decided to do what most people did in Boston, which is throw all their garbage out in their outhouse. So besides the outhouse contents, so you know what, um, we found all their household debris, and that's going to be what we really get to talk about for the stories of these people's lives. The folks at number one weren't very kind because they left us with, yet again, a big pit full of coal ash. So we don't really love the number one families as much as we do the number two families. Um, they're wonderful people, I'm sure, but they weren't very nice to the archaeologists. Um, but the interesting thing is, again, we built this big, they built this big record, oval, this big oval shape um, for both privies with the wall down the middle. We're seeing that echoed in the cistern where they built one big cistern dividing down the middle for two properties. The other thing is that that kind of concrete that you see at the top is the base of the wall. So that wall right there is blocking the access to the other half of the cistern, uh, to the privy. If you dug a hole right there, you find all those artifacts in this photo still sitting down there, and the other 8,000 artifacts that are probably left behind are actually still underground uh, for a future archaeologists to dig up. Um, all right, so this is fresh off the presses of our excavations. Um, this is the cistern for number two and number three unity court, which is, the, if you went out today, that's what we've been digging recently. This is before we dug down a little bit further. Um, it's a little bit hard to see in this photo, but again, we have a total of two different uh, families, where the number two families, which is all the families in the privy, left us this nicely layered deposit on the left of different, different deposits, essentially. We've got five different layers so far, we still have two feet to go. The folks on the right, in the three unity court, I don't know how they did it, but it appears that in approximately 10 seconds they fill up the entire system with one continuous deposit. There's no layers whatsoever. It's very consistent from top to bottom, and weirdly enough, it's mostly full of artifacts from the 1700s, despite the fact that the cistern was built in 1830. So what we think they did was they did something in the yard where they had to dig up a lot of soil, and they dug through that old 1722 building that you saw, that brick house, and dug up a lot of those artifacts, and they dumped them in their cistern. And so that's one of the things we have to do is kind of like look through that and see what's actually happening because there's no way of time traveling and pulling in stuff from the 1700s and dumping in an 1830 system. Um, all right, so now we're going to get into some of the details of the families themselves. Because if you've been following along on Facebook, that's all stuff you've seen. So number one, you the court. It's a very simple story. We have the Crocker family. They show up in 1839. They're not the first people living there, um, but they're one of the first people living there. They don't move out until 1881. For the North End, that's pretty much unheard of. Um, the North End narrative, the assumed narrative, is lots of people moving in, moving out, quickly moving around, every year moving across town. The Crocker families were the opposite of that. They showed up and they stuck around. So we were really excited before we showed up on the site because we were like, oh, this is great. The Crocker family are stable. Number two in the Corps, we'll show those in a second, are not stable. So we're going to have this incredible opportunity to look at the differences between what a one family will do throughout the entire 19th century and what a whole bunch of families in the same place under almost the exact same living conditions will do for that same time period. Again, Crocker family decided to fill up their sister and their privy with coal ash. So apparently that's the difference is that they will be very clean and keep everything very nice and orderly. Um, the one nice thing about the Crocker family, um, they have a great history, but we're not going to go into too much stakes from a lot of artifacts to support it. Um, when they first showed up, they were renters. 
And for about the first half of that time period, I was going year by year through the tax records for this family and the Crockers were living in the house and like three sons were living in the house with their dad and only see the adult men. And then all of a sudden around 1850, the Crockers are listed as the owners. And I was like, good for you, Crocker family, because they lived there for decades and finally they got to buy the house. So they owned that house for the last half of the time they lived there. So it's a bit of an American success story. I really wish they left us more things to play with besides the rap skills. But, um, but we'll move on to number two, you be court. This is the occupancy of number two, you be court. I don't expect that any of you can actually read this, but it gives you a rough idea of just how different these two properties really are. Um, we're going to jump right past that because nobody can read that. So um, I'm going to go through some of the main families that we're seeing. I hate putting text on the slide. I apologize. There's no other way to do this. I couldn't memorize everybody. Um, so the first family that's there for a little while is John Messero. Uh, he's there from 1830 to 1833. In the bottom of the cistern, we found a shattered uh, chamber pot, an indoor toilet, <coughs> dated to 1820. At least that's when the pattern was made. So I'm pretty confident, and it was sitting literally on the bottom of the cistern. Like we pulled this, the chamber pot up, and we saw the bottom of the cistern. So I think that we have day one, first people walk into that door, they look at that ad, they bought the house, they walk in, or they rent in this case, and they start throwing their stuff into the outhouse, and that's the stuff we're seeing. So I believe we have John Messero in the Kirby, not himself, obviously. But um, so but he wasn't the only person living in this house. So in the 1830s, um, we also have Davises, Tennies, Hatches, Sawyers, Crowdies, and Nanobars, and they all show up only one time in the tax records. So these are predominantly English immigrants. Some of them are first generation immigrants, so there's some second and third generation immigrants. And so they may not have thought of themselves as immigrants. I'm a second gen third generation Irish immigrant, if you consider my grandfather, my great grandfather coming in. So I don't consider myself an immigrant per se, but it gives you an idea of um, how, how these families would, would have identified themselves um, as English after the war of 1812. So then we have Lyman Locke showing up. He said from 1835 to 1844, he actually owns the house and rents, or lives in it and rents out other room. So we have a bit more of a stable situation where the owner occupied, but as a thrifty Yankee, he's also renting out rooms and the other floors so that he can actually um, make, his, um, make his mortgage. So he actually works at a bounce factory on Fulton Street, which is a couple streets down past, um, kind of closer to, uh, what's it called? Christopher Columbus Park. Um, he rented out other people, including Samuel Blaney, William Preston, Silas Jones, Isaac Everett, and Amos Chapman. Again, mostly English people, not Irish showing up yet. But um, at the time of the 1850 cents, 40 census, which isn't very detailed, his household included, this doesn't necessarily mean his family, but his household includes one male under the age of eight, two, year, uh, two males aged 20 to 30, one aged 30 to 40, I think that's probably um, Lyman Locke himself, and then two women aged 20 to 30 as well. Some of those are probably his wife and kids. Um, some of those are probably some of these other individuals that are living in the house at the time. So going forward, um, we have Charles Turner living there from 1844 to 1849. He was a tender, and if anybody knows what the heck that means, let me know, because I cannot figure out what tender means, like as a general rule. Usually it refers to animal tenders. I don't see a farm, so I'm assuming that it's not that. Um, but uh, I don't think he was traveling out to Alston Brighton for the house. Um, so he lived in the house from 1844 to 1849. Then the Caruso come in. Caruso, uh, the streets named after the Caruso family. Um, these guys are all Massachusetts-born people. Um, he includes George Caruso, his wife Mary, their son George Jr. And then the, in addition to those individuals, they're actually renting out to recently arrived immigrants from Nova Scotia and Ireland. Um, Catherine Holt um, and Charlotte Robinson, they're turning up in 1850 census, there's other people as well. Charlotte Robinson is 12 years old and she's listed us from the Solomon Islands, which is another name for Hawaii at the time. We have no idea how she's, she got here, or why she's here. Um, she's certainly not directly related to the Caruso, so that's it's by marriage, and she's 12 years old. So there's definitely a story there. I really look forward to getting into that a little bit more down the road when we do more research on these guys. Um, we're really lucky that the Caruso actually owned a tobacco tobacconist store on uh, Hanover Street, I think. Yeah, on Hanover Street. You can see on the lower left side, George T. Caruso & Co., that's their store. So we're not talking about very poor people. This guy actually owns his own store. Um, and here's the ad, tobacco, snuff, cigars, pipes, and etc. on 41 Hanover, opposite Portland Street. Um, Portland Street is actually in Mill Ponds. This is closer to uh, 
um, the uh, market building, um, the new uh, Boston market building, and the north end kind of extended all the way in that direction. All right, so moving forward, Eli Thayer, he's a merchant and druggist. He lives with his family, Nabby, Maria, Mary, Helen, Edward, John, and they also rent out to Margaret Lane, who's born in Ireland. This is our first hint that the Irish people starting to move into the neighborhood. So they're renting out at least one of the rooms, if not the bed, to Margaret Lane, who's 23 years old. She may have actually been a live-in servant. Um, so this family, again, we, we walked onto this site last fall, assuming we've got four people. And then the artifacts were like, no. <laughs> Other than not having a lot of imported Chinese porcelain, which would be really expensive, they actually had really nice stuff. And uh, they've got more artifact photos coming up. Um, but we're already up to 1855, and we still have predominantly English immigrants. Then Benjamin Spear. Um, Benjamin's born in Boston. His wife Hope is born in Truro. All of their family members are born in Boston, except for one girl who's born in Sarah, uh, born in Sarah, born in New York. Um, and they're there until 1860. So we're almost all the way to halfway through the 19th century, we still have mostly English folks of, um, of not recent arrived immigrants, but first and second generation. Um, his job was he actually worked at the Type Foundry, which is located just up the street a little ways. And sure enough, we found a little piece of type, print type, in the printer's, um, from the printer uh, factory itself. This is the letter O. Very exciting, but it's nice to see their, their job showing up on the site too. It's could have been stuck in a shoe, or maybe just had it and carried it around. Um, but it turned up on the site itself. Now we have the Scollies. Um, that this at this point, the, the the value of the house is starting to go down, and the relative wealth of the neighborhood is really starting to march its way down towards extremely poor over the 1860s and 70s. The Scullies are there for the entire 1860s and 70s, but they're living in the house with Roger and Emma Ayres, who are both born in Maine. Charles, Annie, and Gertrude Scully are also living there. They're also born in Maine. So there may have been two families that knew each other that moved down from Maine or had some sort of connection in the past. But um, at this point, every single person in the house is listed as not being able to read or write. So they may be from Maine or born in Maine, but I believe that they were probably first or second generation in the as well. Now the Irish are turning out in full force. So William Kyle, he's there from 1874 to 1885. He's born in Ireland. His kids are Americans. Um, but William and James are also living in the household. We don't see his wife. I don't know if she died or never came over with him. Um, but it appears that his whole family is living in the house from 1874 to at least 1885, although it starts being harder to find people after that year. In 1900, we're going to jump to censuses. We have the Brennan family. They're all Irish born. Now, if you've done any research in the North End, you should be starting to think, wait, 1900, that's the Italians. The Italians are supposed to be here, but we still have Irish folks, and they're actually showing up a little bit late. Um, they're all born in Ireland. In 1905, the Brennans are still sticking around. We have uh, most of the Brennan family, Irish-born immigrants. And then we have the Casamimas, the Catalvos, the Lightings, the O'Donnells, and the Trabucos. So we've got Irish and Italian families living in this house at the same time. Also notice the number of people really starting to tune up. Um, and that's going to happen because, again, the neighborhood itself is getting poorer and poorer and more and more people are pouring in and they're having to live more and more to a room, mostly because they can't afford not to. Um, but we have mixtures of different immigrants living in the house at the same time. 1910, back to all Brennans. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm kind of curious as to what happened there. Um, but we have Madalena Brennan, which is an interesting name for an Irish uh, immigrant child. Um, more of the Brennans in 1920. This is again just the center house that we're looking at. Um, in 1930, we still have Annie Brennan. She's been there for 30 years um, with the Felinos, the Donnies, the Cecitos, the Gaiarales, the Scorpas, and the Spill family. None of these are married individuals. These are all individuals living in the house. I have a typo there, something like that. Um, you see the job she made her, chauffeur, a student, laborer. So again, more people were pouring into the house. And by 1930, the site's done. And in 1933, the property started coming down. It gets converted into the, the garden that you see there. So these are the last folks that are turning up on the site. Um, so going back to the privy, so what does the privy date to? That's the key question now, because that's going to tell us who we're even looking at. Um, and as I was going over this um, this past week looking at the data, I'm like, I'm supposed to be talking about immigrants. But if we have this site stop at 1860, we're looking at second and third generation English people. We're not even looking at the other folks that were living in the house. Um, there's another small subset of Jewish immigrants that are turning up in uh, number three unity court. Um, we haven't gotten into that one for this because I could talk for another three hours if we had to. Uh, but they're, they're in this part of the North End, at least in those three properties, 
one person in one year in the 1870s appears on any records as being, I'm assuming, Jewish. Um, I think his last name is Rosenthal. Um, and I can't tell if he came with his family or if he was just renting a room for one year. Uh, but that's the only, that's the only immig uh, Jewish, um, uh, assumed Jewish uh, immigrant that we have in this, in this house, in any of the three households. Um, so when we found the privy, we got very excited. This is actually the first layer of artifacts. Um, uh, it was a very good day <laughs> when we found this. Uh, so what we're trying to figure out, and we're actually working on this right now, is when the wall came in, it had a four foot foundation, the wall that you see today. Um, when we were digging down to find the top of the privy, we were finding tons of nearly intact artifacts. They were all kind of jumbled up. What we think happened was the construction crews that were here in the 30s digging down through the site to put in that foundation, dug through the top half of the privy. They probably destroyed the 1870s, the 1880s, the 1890s, um, mixing it all up. So I think we have those artifacts. I just think they're a little bit less um, intact as far as where they came from originally. So we might have this issue where we have the Irish and the Italian families, but they're kind of fuzzy in the historic record, or in the, the archaeological record. But once we got to the bottom of that foundation, literally within about an inch of hitting the bottom of that hole that they had to dig before that foundation, we hit this. So we know that that period was intact up until that point. Um, and a couple of things I want to point out, we have medicine bottles. Um, it's at the tip of the arrow. We have a teapot, um, uh, alcohol bottles, lots and lots of tea sets, but very white dishes. That's sort of going to be popular at the time, but it also speaks to uh, wealth. In the 1880s, you had plenty of very fancy looking dishes to buy. 1860s, whenever this was actually deposited. Um, the other thing that we see is there's a fairly intact kind of orange, I'm pointing at the point of the screen that you can see when I'm looking at. Um, there's a fairly intact bottle on the left side that's kind of orange in color that looks like it's fairly shattered, but it's more or less the whole bottle. That's actually an ink bottle. Um, so there's two options there. Either we have a family that needs a lot of ink because they're doing a lot of writing, um, or they're reusing that bottle that used to contain ink as a drinking bottle. It could be either or, we don't really know. Um, so it's either showing us that they are very literate, or showing us that they're so poor that they're reusing it, an ink bottle to drink from. So we're going to actually have to really look at the details of every artifact in this and kind of piece it all back together. Um, I'm presenting this in the middle of our analysis, so I'm not going to give you all of our conclusions, but I'm going to give you where we are right now. Um, but the fact of the matter is they have access to medicine, so they're not, they're not so poor that they don't even have medicine. So that's an important piece of the story. And it seems like they're having uh, specialized dishes. And there's a kind of stick-looking thing roughly in the middle of the photo. That's a long uh, goose bone, possibly a swan bone. It's so large, it may actually be a swan. I don't know who eats swans, but um, that's the only thing that my, my bone specialist has been able to tell me. Um, the next layer below that, we actually hit, a, there was a bit of a gap in the artifacts where it was just mostly dirt. And then below that, we hit another set of artifacts. These are more of the 1830s, 1840s time period. Um, what we're really starting to see at this time period is matching sets. Matching sets were extremely difficult to own and maintain, um, but they were also expensive. If you walked to the corner store, you wanted to buy a set of dishes, they may have only have one or two available. You may not have been able to pick what pattern you wanted. These guys weren't wealthy enough to say, I want to have a zebra pattern from so-and-so company. They went there and said, what's blue and white? <laughs> and they would get what they got. Um, but we have matching sets in this case. Um, in this deposit, we actually have mixed in the same deposit teacups with handles and teacups without handles. So we're, we're entering a new train, uh, uh, new tradition in, in ceramics where people started adding a handle to the teacup. Um, the teacups without handles we're finding intact. And that's a really important thing because what that's telling us is that nobody throws out something if they're dirt poor that's completely intact. The two things that you do if it's intact is somebody left it there and you didn't want it anymore. Um, so maybe another family moved in and said, I don't want this, I've got my own, and threw it on the outhouse. Or they had enough means financially to be able to replace goods that were otherwise totally fine. They didn't need to sell it to a second-hand store. They simply just threw it out. And so it, I'm leaning more in that direction because we're seeing kind of fancy things, including at the very top of, of an oil font for a lamp, which would have held oil lamp, oil lamp, would have held oil, 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 for a lamp, it's completely intact, you can still use it today. So it is fairly fancy, it's probably made in the Cambridge Glass Factory. So again, we're seeing deliber deliberately tossing out of goods that were totally usable, um, but probably replacing things like those tea cups with more modern style glass uh, cups that have handles on them um, and, and are matching the new sets that they're buying. So these are folks that are not that financially stressed in the earliest part of the site. 
Um, just to give you an idea of the scope. Um, the site itself, when we found the outhouse, it was only about three feet long. I'll go back a little bit. Yeah, so that from top to bottom is about three feet, and width is about two feet. From the depth from the top of what you're seeing right there to the very bottom of the privy, it's only about a foot and a half of soil. We pulled out there for 8,000 artifacts in that very, very small area of dirt. At one point, we're in this part where we're pulling the artifacts out and placing them in the buckets. Um, we had five buckets at the top of the privy. Four of them were filled with artifacts, and one of them was filled with dirt. It was just pure stuff inside the site. It was one of the best sites we'll ever, I'll ever probably dig in my career. Um, so this is one singular 10 centimeter level of inside that privy, all laid out on trays. And it gives you an idea of just how much we're in for as far as research goes. Um, on these dishes we have metal goods, ceramic goods, glass goods, tons and tons and tons of bones, buttons, jewelry, um, uh, lots of evidence of what they're eating and drinking, match sets, um, coral, uh, everything you can think of is, is in this site, lots of oyster shells. Um, we have probably another two years before we're going to have a full grasp of what we're actually seeing in this site. So I wish I could give you conclusions, um, but we're working towards them as best we can. But what we're seeing in the privy is, is a much wealthier and much more um, successful financially uh, family occupation in the earliest parts of the site, 1830 to about 1860, than we ever expected. Um, one of the fun parts about digging in the privy is that you get to take the soil and float it. Um, Allie uh, Crowder, who was on our site, I don't know if you're here today, um, she, uh, she's a, a botanical analyst, or botanical analyst, as I like to call them, um, and she floated all of our soils, I meaning she put the soils through running water in it, and it caused all the organic materials to float to the surface. And you can collect the seeds um, from the outhouse, and you can use your imagination as to how they got into the outhouse. Um, and she was telling me that when she first did the processing, she was looking at them under a microscope and noticed that, that, were, that they were kind of dirty. So she decided to do the whole process again with hot water. And the neighboring labs were complaining about the smell because as the, as the heat heated up the soil, the, the odor from the outhouse kind of seeped into the labs at UMass Boston. So we're sorry about that. Um, but what you're seeing in this photo, uh, the thing that looks kind of like a deflated basketball at the bottom, that's a grape seed. Um, that kind of wrinkly thing up in the top center, that's a raspberry seed. Um, the little brown ones that are fairly smooth, those are fake seeds, um, not the cheap thing. And the rest is basically burned and um, whole pieces of shell and wood, um, which will give us ideas about what kind of plants uh, we're growing in the yard itself. Um, uh, Ali said in the privy itself, there's tens of thousands of seeds. So we're going to be able to get a really nuanced idea of how the family's diet changed just in seeds. That doesn't include the thousands of bones that we found and the hundreds of shells. So we've got ungodly amounts of data. And we're really fortunate that we're going to have um, a UMass Boston grad student analyze most of this as part of the master's thesis over the next few years. So we're going to get a lot of great data out of this. Um, but despite the fact that I just showed you all those people that were living in this house and more or less proved to you that there were no Irish people living in the house, this turns up. So I think what's actually happening is we have movements of people. So even though we have this yearly tax record in this semi um, five to 10 year census, we have a state census every five years as well, we're still seeing these immigrants kind of coming through the house a little bit. So we've got this um, ivy slash uh, uh, shamrock um, pipe that turned out. I believe it's from the Irish immigrants that were living in the house. This is exactly halfway down that previous uh, deposit. So that would suggest that we maybe have as late as 1880 numbers in the privy. Again, we're not lucky enough to have a coin at the very top of the privy that says 1890, and we can date everything below that. Before that, we have to go through all of the ceramics, date every single ceramic artifact, and look at the absolute latest anything could be in that, and that becomes our starting date um, based on the analysis of 8,000 artifacts. So we're still working on that part. Um, we have the printer's type from the folks that are living there. These are those, um, those handleless cups that um, tea bowls we call them. Um, a match set of them, two of them found intact, one of them broken. Again, telling us that they didn't like these anymore and they just threw out the whole set. Um, um, we have a cruet set. Again, you don't see these on poor people's tables. You don't have a specialized set of dishes on a table um, that's only there for condiments. That's the only thing you really can use it for. We have three or four of them, so we know that it's not just somebody reusing one of the bottles, but they had essentially a set. Um, you can see it on the left in a modern, not a modern, but a, a contemporary version of what they look like on the right. 
Um, this is one of my favorite artifacts. So this is a cologne bottle that was being sold by the folks in Charlestown who were trying to raise money to build the Bunker Hill Monument. So they had the monument already designed, then they had to raise the money. It sounds like what we're working on for the garden right now. So they actually put out a cologne that was in the shape of the Bunker Hill Monument, started selling it to people. One of the people that bought it lived at number two Unity Court and left it in their house. Whether or not they like the smell, we don't know. Um, but maybe it's supposed to have added to the cologne in it, we don't know. But uh, this is the actual Bunker Hill Monument represented in the bottle. Um, there's that oil font that we found all cleaned up. When we first found it, we actually thought it was metal. And then we started cleaning it, the kind of um, this corrosion essentially of the glass, the outer microns of the glass kind of starting to flake away. Once that came off, which I'm sure um, conservationists would be screaming at me not to do that, but it went back to being clear and stable now, and we can actually see what it looked like um, when it came out of the ground. There's nothing wrong with it. If we put a cap on top of it, we could use it as an oil lamp today. Um, so again, either somebody dropped it in the outhouse while they were going to the bathroom in the middle of the night and looked down there and said, well, whatever, I'm not going after that. Um, or, or they just didn't like it anymore and they threw it out. Um, hopefully not while it was lit. Um, but either way, we have, uh, I think it's five different oil lamps that were found inside the, inside the privy. Um, something you would move around a lot and drop a lot, so that if they broke, they would go in. But we don't really know why this one ended up in there. Um, this is one of my favorites. So W.T. Conway, Conway um, he had a, a druggist shop in Boston, um, and we put this online basically saying, we don't know what this is. If anyone wants to Google it while they're you know, at the computer, let us know. And it turns out that W.T. Conway was um, a maker of venereal disease medication for men and women. Um, you can bet you that nobody in the opportunity court, when they threw this out in their trash can, possibly hiding it in their privy, thought that some idiot archaeologist would come on to it years later, <laughs> digging up their outhouse and find out that they had some sort of VD. Um, I don't think they would really appreciate that. Um, I apologize to them. <laughs> but it's an interesting part of their story, um, and it's important to them. Um, so um, I don't know what time it is. I think we're kind of wrapping or getting close to the end. So I really just kind of start kind of wrapping up with some kind of curious photos of the 1880s in, in this very area and kind of leave you with what I'm thinking about this site. So in general, the stuff that we're seeing on the site just is, is more expensive than I would have ever thought we would have on a 19th century immigrant site in the North End. But what we might actually be seeing is a much more condensed period of time than I was expecting to see. I was hoping to see all the way up to the 1900s. We're still working through that third sister, the second sister, excuse me, um, we have about three feet to go in some of the areas of that sister. There could be another cache of 8,000 artifacts still waiting down there. Um, when the privy stopped being used, it would probably have been stopped the day they got running water. We you know that they didn't want to go to the outhouse or the bathroom. So the day they got running water, they would have killed the privy, probably filled it up with their trash, whatever was left, um, at whatever room there was, and moved on to the bathroom. The cistern, that day, they would have needed they would have needed the cistern up to that day to be empty because they needed to use the water for laundry, that kind of thing. And they would have filled it up after that point. So what we're hoping is the day the cistern stopped being used, so let's say 1870 or so, they stopped using the cistern, uh, sorry, the day the privy stopped being used, they stopped putting the trash in there about 1870 or so, was the day they started putting trash in the cistern. And we're still working our way down through it. And we're hoping that at the bottom of it, we're going to have 1860, 1870, 1890, 1900 from number two in the court. Because I feel like we're still maybe missing those stories. We've got artifacts from that time period in that kind of disturbed upper part of the privy. Um, we have intact wine bottles, we have lots of other bottles and medicines, but it's all kind of jumbled up. I really need that nicely layered deposit so that I can actually sign almost like a time capsule, different deposits to those individual families as, as they were living in the, in the house. Um, so this is a, a view of 1893 in Salem Street, um, just down the road, uh, 115 Salem Street. It's now a five-story building, I believe. Um, the 17th century site that I would love to take. Um, this is the corner of Prince and Salem, where the Prince Postal is, um, with this awesome kid. <laughs> um, so that's looking up towards Old North on the left. Um, and then this is the corner of Charter and Unity, which is just kind of behind us to my, my right. Um, again, you can see the kids. So these kids and the women that are living in these houses are especially hard to see historically. They're not recorded in many of the historic um, records. We get their names every 10 years in the census, but that's every 10 years. Who are we missing in that? In the tax records, we see individuals living in this house every single year, but they're only recording adult men. So the very folks that are in this photo are erased from this part of history. 
So um, what I'm hoping is that we'll have that complete narrative of the entire 19th century and the remaining stuff that we still have to dig. Um, and we can find more toys, we can find more um, household goods that were probably purchased by the women in the family and kind of get their stories back from what was, was the mosque about them. That might be my last slide, yeah. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I hope that's, that's a good kind of <laughs> overview of what we're looking at. Um, but I'd love to answer more questions if you guys have any more specific questions. But thank you very much for coming. So if I had done all that research on the 
Crocker family, I would have been pretty upset because we don't really have anything from them besides a lot of coal ash. Um, so when I turn in my permit, I need to have know what, who owned it, who could be there, um, but also look at other sites in the area to figure out what else has been found. So we've looked a lot at the Plow House, which is pretty messed up, but we have some comparisons there. But the Potter Rear House has actually had a lot of archaeology done on a 19th century deposit. So looking at whether they found drains and cisterns and privies, what do those look like? And we have to say, here's what we could find, but also here's how we would dig it. So my, my permit includes things like every time we find a feature, like the cistern, we're going to bisect it, maybe cut it in half and only dig one half at a time. All the dirt's going to go through an eighth inch screen. We're going to collect a soil sample at every one of those uh, cultural deposits so that we can float it for seeds. So by the time I walk on site, I have a really good idea about what kind of framework I'm going to be looking at. There's always stuff that we learn afterwards, like that advertisement for the building. I had no idea that existed until we started digging. Um, uh, some of the maps even we didn't have access to at that time. So we always learn more as we do more research. But um, once we kind of lock in on the time period that we're really looking at, then we go back and do that kind of creepy, exhaustive research on individual people going back, you know, 100 years or so. Um, we want to know who their great grandkids were, who's alive today that's related to them. Um, what happened in every aspect of their life. We'll be chasing them through every text, um, not text record, um, every town directory to see what jobs they changed, where they moved around the city before and after. Um, we stock them thoroughly once we know who we're looking at. Um, so the next step is that we're going to have to do the, we finished the catalog, we're photographing everything. There's actually somebody at my lab right now who's doing the analysis to figure out what specific dates are we looking at in those deposits. Once we have the dates, we have the deposits, we have the artifacts, we have the people, then we start smooshing everything together. What comes out of that is our kind of historic narrative of, of what it was like to live in these, in these houses each year, for each family, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I know you're looking at right there, but if you go to the other end of Salem Street, 1890s or something, there was a kosher butcher, there was an entire, you know, Yiddish storefront area, yeah. and then you had Mr. Rosenthal here by himself. Was anyone really that stratified that you have them here, and then here, and then here, or is that...? Um, so I don't think it's quite that stratified. I think what it really boils down to is that every single property has its own unique story. And so in our case, one, two, and three unity court has predominantly English folks living kind of well past when they should be living there, when the Irish folks are turning up. And then um, there's a transition period where we have both Irish and Italian people living. We have a very brief um, Jewish population. But that's just one, two, and three unity court. Number four unity court could have um, Jewish population early. So um, what I think this type of dig tells us, and archaeology in general, is there are these big narratives of places, like the old North End is English, Irish, Jewish, Italian, right? But when you look at it as a fine-toothed poem, the cloud house was predominantly English and then German. Was of that, of that, is that because we have a Protestant enclave that close to um, Old North? Maybe, maybe not. We have to look at the Old North records to kind of to see that. Um, but it's, it's a really parcel by parcel, building by building history. Granted, there is going to be kind of clustering of communities around certain places, but there's always outliers. Um, and so what I think is really happening isn't so much that it's that stratified, as it is, we have to look at every parcel as an individual story, um, which just makes it 20 times harder, probably more, to do the research in the North End. But we can't always assume that we've got a storyline when we say English, Irish, Jewish, Italian. It's just way more than us than that. Um, I can't be in two places at once, <laughs> so I don't want to work um, We did just get a permit to start our next dig, which will be in July. Um, I guess this is a semi-official announcement. Um, we're going to be digging at the Pierce Hitchborn House at the Paul Revere Memorial Association. So um, last year, the engineer who runs the Paul Revere House um, came to us, and similar to what Steve did a few years ago, saying, we have this area that we want to do some work in. Let us know what you think. And so we'll do the same sort of research. Um, it's never been done before. It's a 1710 house. Um, like everywhere in the North End, it has a really strong 19th century immigrant story. So I think we're going to be seeing a lot of the similar stuff that we're seeing here, but hopefully with a different twist. Um, but what I'd also love to be able to do is find something from the 1700s. That's actually where it went originally. Because <laughs> um, we got a lot of stuff in this site, but it's, it's the second or third time that they ended in the crown. 
Um, and the other thing is the neighboring property, the Paul Revere House, when they dug that, they actually found the burn layer intact from the 1676 fire that burned down the original town center around the, the first church of Boston. So I'm really hoping that the next property over, the Pierce House, because it's always been built in the same spot, and even back to the 17th century, the yard area has never really been built on, that we might have that layer of burning from the 1600s that will tell us that nice little, like, there it is, there's, you know, Tuesday. <laughs> um, I don't know the exact date, but we will by then. Um, so we have that permit in, in the back, we're ready to start. Um, they asked us to wait until July, um, and so we'll let's start next week. And then between, it'll take a lot of time to sleep. Um, yes, yeah, great question. Volunteers, if you want to volunteer on my digs, um, email archaeology at boston.gov. You can Google Boston Archaeology. I'll put you in our email list. Um, I don't require any experience. Um, and if you want, if you can come on our sites, because we work, unfortunately, weekdays, 9 to 4. Um, but if you can, anybody's welcome on our digs. It's not rocket science. We'll show you how to do it. If you don't mind getting messy, um, it's not that bad, but it can get pretty hot. Um, but we always want people to be involved um, directly. So please, if you have the time and you want to do it, you're always welcome on our digs. Always. If you can't, just stop by and we'll have a visit. Um, do you have time for a couple more questions or should we wrap up? I guess, we, I guess I'll just stop. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you again, Joe. Um, he's such a fabulous speaker. I'm sure you all enjoyed uh, his lecture tonight. On behalf of Old North Church and Historic Site, I want to thank you again for attending our lecture. As the Director of Education here, it's my pleasure to plan these types of public programs for our local community. We hope that we'll see you all again in the speaker series and other events to come. Um, if you would be so kind as to complete a survey, you can tell me what you thought of tonight, and um, I do look at all of them and I take your suggestions seriously. So uh, we have some pens and pencils at the desk on the way out if you need to borrow them. Um, you can hand them to any staff member or just leave them on any surface and we will collect them. Uh, also, for those of you who registered for the community conversation and reception portion of this evening, uh, we will be meeting next door in the, the, the townhouse directly next door to the church in the main first floor room. Uh, we have sold out, however, there are no shows. We are happy to see at full capacity. Uh, for those of you who did not register but are hoping to attend the conversation, just stick around and we'll see if we can, um, can get you in and make sure that we've got a full crowd tonight. Thanks again, and we hope to see you in the future.